Nancy, well, you want to maybe we go add the structural separation, like you said, and then that does seem like there, it's like one or the other if you're going to do something. Right. No point worrying about discrimination if you don't own the thing. That seems to deal with a lot of uh, the issue. So, so shall I jump in on that? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so, so the, I think um, you know while there are are other options, regulatory options on the table. Um, this kind of um, uh, structural separations rounds out the trifecta that I, that I think this panel sort of has has focused is going to focus on, um, and there's a lot of interest in that. You know, it, it showed up in the House Judiciary Committee report uh, last last year. I think it was last year. My pandemic timeframes get get collapsed. Um, it's there's a, another piece of legislation. The um, they all have kind of similar words in them, so you have to distinguish, but the Ending Platform Monopoly Act uh, calls for structural separations that was introduced um, this month. Um, of course, uh, FTC Chairwoman Lena Kahn's, uh, uh got an article on this in the Columbia Law Review from a couple of years ago, and it's in play kind of in various uh, jurisdictions worldwide. So it's structural separations where we would basically designate um, a platform uh, as a business and then ban the owner of that platform from engaging in any businesses that take advantage of the platform on, on either side. Um, you know, I think it's appealing for a number of reasons. First, it seems kind of clean and simple, at least in principle. I think probably the easiest, and, and maybe this is the canonical example that many people have in mind when they think about this is kind of Amazon, Amazon marketplace. Although even there, you know, it's not just Amazon Basics and Amazon Marketplace where Amazon has its own private label product that competes with third party um, sellers. It would be Amazon selling any of those products that presumably would be banned by the, the structural separation. So Amazon would run the, the kind of website, maybe the fulfillment uh, and logistics side uh, that connects consumers to sellers, but it would be prohibited presumably from, from uh, engaging in any of those sales itself. Um, so that I said is sort of the simplest, maybe canonical example. I think it gets a lot more complicated as you drill down to how people are thinking about platforms and related businesses um, when you move beyond Amazon and Amazon Marketplace. So for example, um, you know, Lena Khan in her, in her article has the example of Alexa and Alexa skills or the uh, Apple iOS and the App Store, similar for, for Google Android. Um, and, uh, and I'll say in a minute kind of why I think that that starts to get a lot more complicated. And I think just if you think about Google's business in general, it's, it's uh, um, you start to realize it's um, uh, first the kind of um, big four, the GAFA that, that um, much of the proposed legislation in the U.S. that came out this this um, uh, this month focuses on, um, you know, they're they're more dissimilar than similar, and I think that is going to create um, some concerns as we think about regulatory solutions. All right, so that's so clear, but but maybe clean and simple is a, we can describe it, um, and we just say eliminate the ownership that eliminates the incentives. You don't have to worry about all the complexities that Aaron and Carl talked about. Second, I think, is the recognition that behavioral restrictions that don't remove incentives for self-advantage um, create large um, uh, potential profits for firms to evade or to distort or to you know, somehow um, uh, uh, challenge and work around. Um, so again, this kind of um, structural separation seems like uh, it, it, it avoids that. Um, and third, uh, to go to some of what's already been discussed, if we think about regulating terms of access, either kind of non-discriminatory um, requirements, um, uh, you know, um, requirements to deal, um, uh, potentially going all the way down to access pricing for access to the platform. Um, while those seem theoretically tractable, the implementation is quite daunting. Um, and particularly, and while I think Carl um, has a different view on this, and I'm sure Fiona does as well than I do, um, you know, access pricing, if we go down that route, does in fact affect investment and uh, incentives and innovation in dynamic settings, which is tech on steroids. And, uh, and there's actually some empirical evidence, say in the telecom space, 
where when you get access pricing wrong, those distortions um, can have measurable uh, consequences. Um, and, um, and so while we've got some experience with um, access pricing in, in more traditional public utility settings, um, I, I, I think the, as we start to think about how we'd actually um, uh, implement that, um, that maybe leads some people to think, well, let's just avoid it entirely by, by creating bans on um, being on both, both operating the platform and, and competing on the platform. Um, okay, that said, and I'm sorry, Fiona, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, lay out negatives. I think it's important to understand kind of you know, what we're dealing with as we think about how we wanna try to address these problems. Um, structural separation is a very blunt tool First, that may not solve many of the concerns that have been expressed about platform companies. Um, and uh, you know, as I as I read both some of the um, some of the writing on on advocating for structural separation and some of the kind of legislative history and the the um, House report, you know, many of the things that people are unhappy about with the platform companies um, are are unlikely to be. Um, uh, remedied by, by structural separation of platforms from other businesses alone. And moreover, they may incur unintended consequences. So I said Amazon and Amazon Marketplace, I thought might be a kind of poster child for this. Um, I think one question maybe we start with is, and others may know the answer to this, is tech has not been a, a field that I have studied as an empirical economist. You know, Amazon Marketplace clearly has a very dominant role in online retail. But to ask why has Amazon Marketplace eclipsed eBay, um, e despite eBay's earlier and very successful start, um, uh, you know, decades ago, and how confident are we that the reason that Amazon Marketplace has eclipsed eBay has nothing to do with the fact that Amazon is also competing on that platform, not just running it um, uh, uh, off of commissions. Um, another, just to think along those same lines as we think about structural separation, does that just apply to Amazon? So are we going to think about applying it with a market cap that says we're just talking about GAFA because those are the big tech firms we're worried about these days? You know, but how would something like this affect, say, Walmart, which is beginning to develop its own third-party marketplace, much less rich, at least in my you know, casual um, buying experience, than Amazon, or to take um, something like that that's, that's restricted to just one aspect of, of um, e-tail, um, say Newegg, which focuses on tech hardware, you know, um, if they either are bound by this, so they've got, mostly they're selling their own products, they aren't selling a lot of third-party products, if they were bound by this, do they just withdraw from that market, leaving no options but the Amazon platform for third-party seller, well, Amazon and I guess eBay for third-party sellers. Um, if they expect to be bound by this structural separation requirement, if they become too successful, you know, do they decide not to get into this space? What incentives does that create? Um, so kind of what are the competing options for third-party sellers? Um, seems to me to, to, to be a question we ought to be asking and how this would, um, would affect uh, uh, implementation of this kind of, of requirement. Um, you know, does this apply, uh, does expansion of platforms into new areas, which has created a lot of consumer value, arguably, um, notwithstanding myriad problems that it's also created, does that apply equally to organic and acquisitive growth? You know, would structural separation requirements, ex post versus ex ante requirements, again, to go to this kind of Walmart New egg Amazon question. Um, will that enhance or diminish the kind of expansion um, of platforms into new areas? So, how do we think about um, if we're going to go down this route, writing requirements or writing regulations uh, in a way that that keeps as much of the good that we think we get um, without uh, the negatives that we're concerned about? Um, and, you know, I think some of this takes us back to the Microsoft browser case. Some of these same issues arose um, in that context. Carl mentioned, you know, a little bit of this got into this with, you know, how much is in the operating system versus um, in the apps if we're restricting whether you can have apps or not, um, which I think just goes to, to say the, even though structural separation seems clean and easy, maybe the, the boundaries are a lot more fuzzy than we, than we think they might be. Um, and the final thing I'd leave us with is um, 
Uh, you know, vertical integration is common in many new industries or product markets. You know, it goes back a long ways to kind of um, conventional infant industry arguments that if you don't have a very thick market, you may need to sort of um, vertically integrate, provide some of these um, uh, services or, or components yourself. Um, and, and so I think as we consider structural separations, um, we want to, to pay a lot of attention to whether we block um, organic vertical integration um, and, and when we do that and how that affects uh, the development of, um, of some of these markets. I, I, you know, I guess think my sense is that um, that often the arguments that are made, particularly say in antitrust settings, about uh, discouraging um, uh, incentives for innovation are are overstated. But I do worry in this particular sector where I think the the innovation is what's created a lot of value for consumers um, that, that we not unintentionally um, destroy that, that mechanism. And so this might be a place where even if some of the kind of lighter touch regulatory solutions are difficult to implement well, and we're never gonna do it perfectly, um, you know, maybe some combination of more assertive antitrust that creates real deterrence to exclusionary behavior, um, uh, you know, more effective um, deterrence of anti-competitive acquisitions, particularly of nascent competitors, um, with maybe some light touch regulation, um, lets us get further than, uh, than a tool like structural separations would. But that's my two cents and let me maybe see how many people have uh, disagreement over that. Look, let me, I just gotta jump in this. I really, particularly what you said towards the end there, Nancy, I really agree. I think this is, these, these strong structural separation laws are a really bad idea. They would be very destructive to economic growth. I mean, in the United States world, but around the world too, basically, um, I just think it's a really bad idea. It's driven by the politics, not economic. It's driven by the politics to cut these firms down to size. Um, on the view, they have too much political and economic power. Look, just think about all the ways in which the big companies attack each other's spaces, and that that would be difficult, if not if not illegal. Um, uh, you know, if Amazon's not allowed to have house brands, they're attacking all sorts of uh, margins and profits for other sellers. Google's Android going after Apple's iOS. You know, I don't think Google could do that if they have their search platform. They're going to this have this other thing. Android, um, Apple Music, you know, challenging Spotify, um, Microsoft Bing challenging Google. I mean, pretty much all that would not be allowed. I mean, some of just the reality is these 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 behemoths going at each other is really important, and structural separation uh, prevents that. Okay, now we're when many of us around the world are uneasy when a dominant firm, you know, let's say attacks, to use that word, or challenges adjacent markets because oh, they have all these advantages and they'll you know they'll exclude. But to say they just can't do it at all is just is, is really, really contrary to the important aspects of the competitive process. So when I go back, I also think, what problem are we trying to solve here exactly, okay? I mean, somebody really have to convince me these are immense problems that you, would, that you, have, to, you have to deal with in order to, to cause all that trouble with these rules and, and cut off so much competition. So I think part of this is an overstated view of the problems. And so I do go back to if we, if we have problems that are more targeted and antitrust has not, not been doing enough, which I think is true in the US, then, then a more targeted approach such as the um, no self preferencing is the way to go, even though it's hard. And I said it was hard, but do it. It's just, it's just hard work. Roll up your sleeves and do that in a selective way. But this, this structural separation, you know, it's just a really bad idea driven by the politics. I'd like to say something. Go ahead, Aaron. I can say something very briefly, which is uh, I'm much more sympathetic and eager to have uh, rules against self-preferencing than the uh, structural solutions, because I think the solutions are pretty facile. And if there are big incentives to 
preference to make money, then those can be probably mainly duplicated with vertical contracts, even in separated companies. So one may not get what one wants with the vertical separation. And I think ultimately you need to dig in to the regulation of self-preferencing if you really want to solve the problems. I wanted to say something about timing. Uh, one of the things I noticed on the last panel was Fred Jenny saying, let's not do anything until we're sure about what we're doing. Uh, here's Nancy saying, well, let's fix it by passing a more robust antitrust law. Let me just point out that that's decades, you know, we would be decades, maybe centuries away from fixing the problems we have created by not having robust enough antitrust laws to date if we waited till we were sure everything was perfect, or if we passed more robust antitrust laws and then tried to fix things by deterring future horses escaping the barn. I mean, the horses have escaped the barn. We can close the barn door and I'm totally in favor of closing the barn door and having stronger laws in various ways. But we have escaped horses out there and they are doing a lot of damage. And there's a question of how many decades we wanna let them continue to do that damage. And I think one of the concerns that I have, while I understand, that antitrust is not supposed to be uh, fixing political problems, and I'm 100% on board with that. I think we have a democracy problem in the United States, and it is exacerbated by the existence of these large companies. So I don't actually think we have decades to wait. And when you talk to, uh, my kids are in their 20s, and uh, the thing that's interesting about the youthful generation is they're also not patient. They're not interested in a solution that happens when they're 40. They're 23 and they think that a solution should happen when they're 24. And that's just, I think, a reality of what the political forces are here. And that's why I think, and the same is true in Europe in the sense of Vestager patiently having gone after Google for a decade and it didn't work. So now she's got another five years and she's got to find something that works in a short amount of time. And that's why everybody's turning to regulation, I think. And um, that's an upside to regulation. If you decide you know what you want, you can actually execute it. You don't have to wait for the next nascent entrant to come along, protect it, let it grow, let it destabilize the current incumbent. Maybe it doesn't work. We have to go back to the drawing board. The next nascent entrant comes along, we protect that one. And in seven years, we have a new, uh, maybe uh, a new platform. So I, I think I'm just not patient anymore and I, I want something to happen and I'm not interested in waiting. Well, till that, that, Fiona, I think, so first, I'm sorry if I was not clear. I do not think that I was saying we should pass new antitrust laws and wait 20 years to see if they work and, and then we'll come back and revisit this. What I said I is, it. and this goes exactly to, to something that Carl raised. Like I, I, I thought that the most insightful outcomes of the Google and Facebook complaints or the most insightful um, uh, um, allegations in the Google and, and Facebook complaints were about exclusionary contra contracts that they signed with their large competitors in other spaces, suggesting at least to me, the only reason I could see billions and billions of dollars changing hands for those contracts was that they were worried about those other firms coming in to compete in their home turf. And so I don't know if just filing those cases will be effective in limiting that, but it does strike me that if you want effective entry, that's a space in which you might want to encourage these firms to start mucking around in each other's markets. The yeah. same with kind of acquiring nascent competitors. I'm not saying that's all we should do. And I thought the second part of what I said was, let's Let's push on, on both the kind of exclusionary behavior and the acquisition of nascent competitors because that's setting the ground for future entry and effective competition. But we also may well wanna think about regulatory solutions. And I thought what I was saying is, I don't think structural separation is gonna give us what we want in, in, against many of the complaints that we've got. And so maybe despite the problems with some of these kind of lighter touch regulatory solutions, whether it's non-discrimination or um, uh, requirements to deal or whatnot, maybe we ought to be thinking about how we could implement those more effectively. And, and that's what brings us back, at least brings me back to these uh, rules against self-preferencing that, that and I, it is a form of regulation. <laughs> I mean, that's what we need. It's not ex expecting antitrust to do it. 
it can operate reasonably quickly. I mean, you know, if, if I think in the US we need Congress to, to, to make it meaningful, but they've got those on the table. It has a lot of intuitive appeal. They said it appeals to Barack's kids, so we're good. Um, look, and furthermore, look, I think what's going on is this structural separation bill is never going to go anywhere, most likely, because it's, it's, it's caused, it caused so much damage. Cicilline himself introduced the no self-preferencing bill. OK, so the way Congress works, not that I'm an expert on it, but you know, you put out some extreme stuff you can then give up on. So, so it makes, it makes non-discrimination look much more moderate and reasonable. OK, um, so, so that is a path forward. And uh, it's not a matter of waiting decades. Um, and I, so I think that's a very possible path that could happen. Um, not easily, and there are a lot of details. We need an agency to implement it. And look, other countries are doing it, and Israel too. Even a smaller country with its, its you know, you can you can see what you can see what the U.S. or the CMA is the place to look right now. Okay, in the U.K., see what they're doing. You can kind of copy slash adjust that for your own economy or for your own circumstances, and put those those rules in place. So I think it's very implementable and scalable, you know, scalable in the sense that it can spread to other countries. Um, and this is a case, you know, where you copy, you copy what others are doing and, and uh, we'll see who the, who the pioneers are, let's call them, let's, or guinea pigs, depending on how you want to put it. Um, so I think this is, this is where things, I think probably will go and I think should go. I wanted to make one brief comment about uh, Fiona's worry about democracy, which I'm intensely worried about. I don't think the democratic problem we have is from the four big firms being too big. Uh, that would be a problem where they controlled Washington because they have directly because they have so much money. You know, the problem, the democratic problem we have if it's connected to the four big firms, is probably mainly about Facebook. And it's not about Facebook being too big, it's all the disinformation that we see on Facebook. And if you ask why there's so much disinformation on Facebook, it's again, not because Facebook's so big, it's because that grabs attention and Facebook is in the attention business. And if we break up Facebook, Facebook is producing a bunch of bads, as Carl and I argued in an op-ed. And if you break up Facebook, it's anything but clear to me, you will get less bads and more democracy. So, so this is why I'm in favor of interoperability. I will send you the article I wrote with Michael Cadiz. But I think that if I could uh, belong to, an, I, to a site that did a better job of content moderation while still being able to stay in touch with my cousin or the school or whatever. So I know when the snow days are, not that we have those anymore, but uh, then you'd get a lot more people leaving Facebook. That right now you might not like the content moderation. Uh, you'd be happy to go someplace that was just like Facebook without the neo-Nazis, right? That would be a very attractive uh, social media site and that doesn't exist in the United States. But if you had mandatory interoperability, then there could be sites that were very, very clean or sites that were you know, run by nonprofits and had certain goals or whatever. There would be a flowering of content moderation and people could vote with their feet. Now, does that mean that we'd get rid of all bads? Certainly not, but given that what my understanding of what's allowed with free speech, it's very hard to tell some platform what to do. And the far easier thing is to let people leave. And right now they can't leave. Uh, not if they want to stay in touch with their friends. And, and my kids don't ever make a telephone call. They don't send email. They barely read the email from their mother. I mean, they're only on these platforms. So it's the modern technological infrastructure. And when we had this problem before with AT&T, we said, you have to be interoperable. Well, I would also say, I think a more direct solution to the democracy problem, since it's on the table now, or not a solution, but one element, a small bit of it, it is to impose more liability for, for misinformation. And this is perfectly consistent with, um, with uh, free speech, you know, our Const First Amendment of the US Constitution. Uh, and Aaron and I, forgive me for outing you, Aaron, we just talked about this privately, but a notion that if the, if the speech on the platform shows a reckless disregard for the truth, 
then the platform is can be liable for that, particularly if they've got technology that directs people and 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 towards that content. You know, this could be YouTube, it could be Facebook, it could be any of these. They're doing a, it's not just neutral. You know, this notion, oh, we're just the platform that stuffs us out there is is bogus with all the algorithms that are operating. So that seems to me to create a real opening for liability that could go a long way. Um, you know, Paul Romer has recommended a tax on digital ads as, as another way to go. Maybe some of you have seen that. And because of these, these problems with the attention economy and he makes some good points, but I think, why would you just tax digital? I mean, the, the, the technology is to deliver the content. It's not the point. The point is really, are you creating uh, misinformation that's destructive to public discourse and democracy only. And Fox News does just just is a lot more important in that respect than Facebook. Um, so I don't think it should just be digital. 